right, hi everybody. Welcome tonight to the Surplus Store and Recycling Center Town Hall. Uh, we're really excited to have you here with us tonight. We're going to be talking about composting with worms. And uh, we are uh, lucky to have three uh, worm wizards with us today. Uh, one worm wizard, one worm warrior, and uh, their expert uh, mentor, John Bierenbaum from the Horticulture Department. Um, my name is Katie Duska, the education coordinator here, and uh, let's please welcome uh, the crew. John, if you'd like to start, please. Thank you, Katie. And I, we didn't talk about that, but I go more by worm whisperer, so we can have the whisperer, the, the wizard and the warrior. But uh, I've been at uh, Michigan State for 35 years now on faculty and uh, have had the pleasure of doing many different things over those years, a lot of teaching. Uh, initially with greenhouses and floriculture, and then with organic farming and helping to start the student organic farm. And the last 10 years have been working on the Close the Food Cycle Loop project that we're going to be sharing about tonight. Sean, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending tonight. I am Sean Barton. I'm the operations supervisor at the MSU Surplus Store and Recycling Center. And uh, I have had the privilege of learning with from Dr. Beerbaum and many others about uh, vermicomposting and doing it on a large scale. I first started vermicomposting myself uh, back in college in 2009 uh, with just my wife in a townhouse. And I'd love to tell you more about that in a few minutes, but I'd like to welcome everyone and learn, help uh, learn you, help teach everyone how we can uh, manage weight resource and uh, closing that food loop, which you'll learn about in the next couple minutes here. So welcome. All right, hello everyone. My name's Julia. I'm the student intern for the Vermicompost Project. Uh, that's pretty much my intro. <laughs> and my name is Chris Hewitt. I'm an operations coordinator for the Recycling Center and Surplus Store, and I will be moderating the comments tonight in Q&A session. All right, great. Um, so before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping um, comments. We are recording tonight's webinar, so um, it will be available on our surplus, I mean, on our recycling website. Um, and we're also live on Facebook. So when we um, are speaking, if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A box if you are following on Zoom. And if you are on the Facebook um, stream, go ahead and just put those in the comments. We will um, take comments um, or questions all at the end. Um, and then one other thing is that we will be showing some slides. And so if you want to um, you know, dive deep into the um, images or any of the text that's on the slide, you can uh, choose to adjust the view on your Zoom screen um, just by dragging um, you know, that invisible line between the, the faces and the PowerPoint. Um, and at the end of the session, we will have a exclusive um, coupon for the surplus store for everyone um, as a token of our appreciation for you coming and engaging with us tonight. Um, so uh, just a brief background before uh, we hear from the, um, the, the worm team, the vermicompost operation is the latest addition to the surplus store and recycling centers repertoire of waste mitigation um, tactics. So we're really excited to have this operation just launched on our, um, on our grounds, but this is not something that's new to MSU. Um, Dr. Bierenbaum has had this operation um, in the works and been operating it um, at uh, the student organic farm through the horticulture department for the last decade. And we're really grateful to be able to carry that um, legacy on and hear from him and then uh, Sean Barton, who will be taking it over, um, you know, in the operation standpoint at Surplus and Recycling. And then we'll also hear from Julia, who will tell us uh, some of her experience as an intern. Um, so we'll start with John, who will give us a bit more of the technical background and share about how his own personal experience um, has really been uh, the, uh, the jumpstart for this operation. So um, with that, John, uh, feel free to take it away. Thank you, Katie. And let's see, this is gonna, here we go. So, and I need to reduce this and I think we're ready to go. So uh, what we're gonna try to do tonight is uh, <laughs> In a, in a short sense, uh, take the last 10 years and try to tell you a little bit of the story in about 10 minutes. 
and I am going to talk a little bit about some of the general vermicomposting methods for those of you that are interested in that and then talk about the specific vermicomposting methods that we've been developing and using in the project. And then at the end, show you a little bit about uh, using vermicompost for growing plants. And you know, the project when we started uh, some time ago was uh, under the, this heading of closing the food cycle loop. And to me, what that means is, is that we have uh, our crops that we grow at the farm in this case, uh, at that point, it was the student organic farm. And we know that if you keep harvesting crops and take them, taking them from the farm, that you need to be able to replenish the soil. And that that's often done on conventional farms with using uh, fertilizers, manufactured fertilizers. On organic farms, it's done more with using cover crops and compost and then some organic inputs. So this is a chance for us to, instead of having food residue or food waste that uh, doesn't return to the farm, let's say it would, the alternative is, is it would end up in the uh, landfill, that now we can, through composting, get it back to the farm and completing that loop. So that's the idea of closing the food cycle loop. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I've enjoyed the last 20 years or so of working with uh, alliteration. And so for this one, we've got uh, a quick uh, objective for the project is to validate and vivify vermicomposting with, with variations and variables as a viable, valuable venture and vector for vigorous, vibrant, voluptuous vegetation and vegetables. So you can see if you can swallow that one for a bit. But uh, with the red worms, you know, one of the things is to realize is that there are thousands of species of earthworms around the world but there's only about six that are used for composting. And most of them are worms that are only adapted to tropical or subtropical conditions. And it takes a certain type of worm that can tolerate being in close proximity like this. Most worms are, or many worms are more separate and they stay apart. In this case, uh, the Acena fetida or composting worm or red wiggler uh, doesn't mind you know, being together and they also reproduce very quickly. One of the reasons why we wanted to use worms, why I proposed worms 10 years ago, was in, in general we want to get people more excited and interested about composting. And uh, in a normal compost pile there's a lot of bacteria and a lot of organisms that you don't get to see. In the case of the worms, people are excited about it, both youth, you know, people of all ages are excited to see worms moving about, and it's easier to tell the story of composting what's going on. It's also the vermicompost tends to be a high, higher value compost, so that's a good thing for both the composter and for getting people to value compost. And we'll show and talk about in some of our research and in other people's research that the vermicompost does seem to have some unique benefits for managing plants, particularly in an organic system. So quick close up of a worm and just thinking uh, some key things that are important for what I'm gonna share tonight is, is we're gonna talk about how the food has to be broken down in a form that the worm can consume because a worm has a really small mouth. So worm doesn't eat the food scraps, we need to pre-compost or break down the food scraps first the other thing is, is a worm doesn't have a lung system like uh, mammals do. Uh, the exchange of oxygen and CO2 occurs through the skin. So that means it's really important for the water to be available and for the, the skin to be wet. And the other thing that I mentioned, the worms can reproduce very quickly. It takes about 60 days from uh, hatching from an egg before they can be mature. And uh, then from, uh, let's see, once the, the egg is laid, then it takes about 60 days for that egg to hatch. And this is just a quick uh, show of uh, worms are hermaphroditic. There's not male and female. They both have both uh, types of organs, but there is an exchange of sperm. And then there's uh, the, the cocoons that form that include multiple worms. And then eventually that small little worm uh, emerges. So it's, there's a lot to learn about worm composting. And this was one part of our uh, uh, 
journey to do this. And I have like an hour long lecture that we can talk just about worm biology. Um, I mentioned earlier about the worms being from tropical and subtropical regions. And that's where much of the worm composting in the world occurs because it's much easier. They don't have con cold conditions like what we have where we have to protect the worms and mainly they just have to protect the worms from excess rain. And so you would see very simple systems like this and they're very common in countries like India and uh, uh, around the world in Asia where uh, the worm compost provides an important source of locally available nutrients. Most of you might be familiar with the idea of a worm bin. That's what we would see in this area of the cold climate. And just a simple, this would be like an 18 gallon tote where we would put in materials that we would call bedding like newspaper and then uh, add the food scraps to it. And there is again, bacteria and fungi breaking the material down so that the worms can consume it. And uh, this will be one that we don't have time to go into all the detail, but uh, uh, the bedding can be newspaper or cardboard or leaves, um, and the feed can be any type of kitchen scraps or pasta or rice or things like grass clippings. And usually in a bin, you have a lot of bedding and then you gradually add feed over time and it breaks down. And I'm sharing this because I'm going to see that when we, the methods that we use are not like this, we use a slightly different method. Part of uh, getting into this project was uh, we've lived here in Haslett for 25 years now. We're fortunate to have 10 acres and my wife has a couple of horses and uh, I get to manage the horse poop after she picks it up. And uh, I learned kind of by accident that we had the red wigglers in our compost piles and uh, how they were there. And that started me learning how to manage them and that I could keep them alive in the winter time just by keeping the compost pile hot, but not too hot. And that often involves the way that the material is added as well as uh, making sure it doesn't get too much snow or too much water because a lot of water will just uh, cool off the compost pile. So you can see I'm judiciously using plastic to help keep it warm. And so I started learning about that and then I started uh, doing some worm composting in bins in our high tunnel and seeing if I could keep the worms alive over the winter. And I learned that they, I could, and that these two bins under this table actually produce enough worm compost throughout the year to keep a 20 by 60 high tunnel. Uh, so I have 10 four foot by 10 foot beds plus some other space and I can manage all of that with the fertility that just comes from the worm composting. And you know, the, I manage these different ways in the summer or winter. In the winter time, we're trying to keep them warm, but the worms are in there. And uh, I just have to make sure that the temperature is protected or, or that it, uh, the sun in the greenhouse keeps it warm. And it was this idea that allowed me to propose to the university that we would look at using a high tunnel, which we had already had at the student farm for growing vegetables in order to uh, raise the worms and to, to use this on a larger scale. So this was built in October of 2010, 10 years ago. And it was the start of the closing the loop firmer composting project. This was about a $10,000 structure and we built it, you know, the students helped build it. And over time, and the interior, we developed many different ways of worm composting. So we made some, just an extra large bin that we managed much like a bin. We had uh, uh, multiple bins in this case, using uh, a lot of lumber that actually used to, came out of dorm rooms and we were growing plants in and we had structures with plastic over it to help keep the worms warmer. And then we developed these wedge systems on the right and that's the main method after the first five years that we decided was the main method to go forward that would work for um, farmers and we learned that we had to really understand the temperature and the moisture and how we provided the food and how many salts were available and also about ph were just some of the examples you know one of the things we learned is is that the worms could tolerate very cool conditions here uh, there was some ice in the bed actually for a short period of time and the worms were moving around 
uh, but it takes, they have to be able to adapt to that and there, there's a managing the conditions is important. One other factor that I'll bring in that uh, helped me to shift my thinking was going to the International Worm Conference at North Carolina State for three years from 2012 through 2014. And there I learned about this, the worm power installation in New York, where you can see they're all inside of uh, uh, barn type structures that took over $10 million to build and then with all the mechanized system inside. But by learning about how they use the system, it's fed on the top and then the worm um, compost is collected out the bottom. And it's only, the worms are only in it for 60 days. And I learned a lot about how a larger operation can manage worms and we started applying that. And one of the things that they do is they don't bury food. They take the food and they mix it together and then they pre-compost it for a week to two weeks before they feed it. And so this is at home when I had my small bins, I started just combining my paper and food scraps and peat moss and horse manure in the wheelbarrow and getting it nice and wet. And then I would just take that and put it on top of my bins and the worms would crawl into it. And that's a easier method than some of the other methods. So as we ramped that up at the student farm, one of the things that we had for bedding was the large number of leaves and we would, uh, the city of East Lansing would bring those out to us, about 10 truckloads. And we learned, you know, that just the leaves alone would make really great compost. But we, we did is we would then take the kitchen food scraps from campus, including coffee grounds and lots of pineapple tops. And you see here and combine those with the leaves and then pre-compost them. And then we would take them to feed the worms. So we learned that Pre-composting, it really does a lot of things for us. It helps us to balance the moisture and remove the seeds that are present and take care of fruit flies. And a lot of the things that become issues with small scale composting are reduced by doing the pre-composting. When we do add the material, this is a diagram to just try to help you see that we start on one side of the greenhouse and with a small amount of compost with the worms in it. And then each week we will feed more compost in a thin layer. And this is where the wedge comes in. And it, we travel across from left to right and the worms move. And eventually all the worms are on the right side and we can go in and shovel out all the finished compost on the left. So it's important that we don't have to screen out worms. We do screen the compost to make a nice uniform project, but a product, many, uh, vermicomposting operations use a screen like this to remove the worms from the compost. And to me, that's kind of hard on the worms. And we, I like that our system doesn't have to do that. Uh, after we screen the finished product, we got a nice uniform product that we uh, maintain in bulk bins, either like this or in bulk bags. And then when the time comes to sell it, we'll put it in the four gallon buckets, which uh, hold about 20 pounds of worm compost and are sold at for $20 at the surplus store. And we have our own label, the Grow Green Verma Compost, and what will nourish your soil, your plants, and you, and worms. I wanted to use worms will, but the university said you can only put Spartans will in front of that. I couldn't do worms will. So that's what we have. But you know, the last little bit here is some examples of how you can use the Verma Compost. Uh, in your garden, we don't recommend spread, spreading it across the whole garden you would be more using it uh, judiciously and putting it in the hole when you're planting a transplant, for example, or this example with some cucumber seedlings. These plants are all the same age, but about a week before this picture was taken, uh, different rates of worm compost were spread on the flat. So it was a, a larger flat. It would have had uh, 12 of these containers in it. And uh, you can see that as we put more from half a cup to one cup to two cups that the plants just got bigger and better. So this is you know, one of the ways it can be used. It can also be used when you're uh, growing in containers. Uh, this was one more example of our, from our research of you know, lettuce you know, without worm compost on the left and with on the right after just a short period of time. And it doesn't take very much at all for this to happen. And you know, one thing that is different about the worm compost, because it's made at a lower temperature, not at the, the high temperatures that we do with thermophilic or hot composting, 
that it uh, has more biology in it and different types of biology. Because the worms grind it up, it does have finer particle size and it does appear to have more soluble nutrients. So based on that, we used it for you know, specific purposes. This is uh, our backyard at home and I do a lot of work with container growing you know, for demonstration and education. And I have some of these plants have been in containers for 10 years and the only thing that they've gotten really fertilizer wise is uh, vermicompost. So lots can be done. Here's a simple example with some rosemary plants in the upper right, you know, just the addition on the surface. So it's not just a source of nutrients, it's also a source of biology and also provides carbon. It does a number of things. Uh, my closing point here will be that uh, you need to realize that there are different types of products out there. And while they're all labeled the same as firma, usually worm castings instead of worm compost, some like the one on the bottom where they're used for raising worms for bait, they actually have very little nutrients in them. And by adding higher rates, you don't get a much bigger plant. Whereas the type from worm power on the top there, that's made from dairy uh, cattle manure and it has quite a bit of nutrients. And you can see as they added more and more in the research, the plants got bigger and bigger. So with that, uh, I think we got more like 15 minutes instead of 10 minutes, but the project just has many parts, you know, learning all about collecting campus food residue, which uh, we haven't talked about yet. And John will tell you a little bit about, but that's actually a, a lot of work that happens to make that possible. And then we've worked on researching the vermicomposting, how to deal with cold winters and hot summers, how to feed the worms, how to harvest it. And then we're still working on the selling and demonstrating the uses of vermicompost and really hoping that we're, we can continue to engage more people in this whole project of closing the food cycle loop. You know, we're at a point now where we can hand it off and uh, go into the next phase. And it's gonna be there for many years at the uh, recycling center and surplus store as a great educational demonstration. Something that the recycling center is really excited about is how we can connect operations at the university with the academics and that students and faculty and staff need to know more about what it takes to run the university. And, and this is going to be one way that we do that. So with that, I can stop sharing my screen and pass off to Sean and I'll be back later for questions. Excellent. Thank you, John. I'm going to share my screen now and there we have it. So um, welcome again, everyone. I'm Sean Barton, the uh, operations supervisor at uh, the Circle Store Recycling Center and uh, the current worm wizard. I'm happy to be uh, handed the torch and keep that beacon uh, growing uh, literally here at the uh, Circle Store. So um, I want to talk about why are we vermicomposting? Why not just landfill it all? Um, you know, landfills do collect the methane gas that is produced by food waste, yard scraps, and that sort of material in the landfill. So there, that is a quote unquote good thing for landfills. Um, however, there's there's a better use for that. There's so much energy that's hidden within food that it almost seems a shame to waste it by putting it in the landfill. And uh, composting, specifically vermicomposting, is a great way of harnessing that energy and really managing that waste as a resource. I grew up um, near a landfill uh, at, by the Palace of Auburn, Auburn Hills and saw that landfill grow and grow in size. And if you go up, try past it today, it looks like a mountain. I will go on record and say landfills are a good thing. It's great that we can pool all our resources and waste together and put it in one spot as opposed to our backyard but there's too much going into it. Americans waste almost one pound of food per day. Even a Spartan on campus wastes nearly 3.08 ounces per meal. That's like a pizza slice. Uh, one of my great partners, Carly Yonsity from RHS has done a lot, a lot of work with clean plates at state measuring food waste on campus. There's a difference between pre-consumer and post-consumer. Uh, pre-consumer would be, you know, things that are produced before it gets to the person eating that meal. So like uh, onion peels, carrot tops, pun intended, that sort of stuff. Whereas post-consumer is plate scrapings and that's uh, a kind of a different venue or a stream of uh, material, the stuff before it gets to a plate versus the stuff that gets to after a plate. So how I got started was in 2009, I had learned about Dr. Bierenbaum and some worms and um, was in a townhouse with my um, now wife. 
And we wanted to try to manage our waste as a resource and saw, you know, all the waste that was happening with our food waste and why just throw it away. So we started with worms. Um, we got a book, Worms Eat My Garbage, and uh, designed my own bin. And I now I started with a 13 gallon rubber made bin. Now I have a 96 foot long hoop house, which is quite a bit of a different size and scale. But uh, with that, I've learned a whole lot on um, vermicomposting. And I want to tell you a little bit about it. So problem that we have on campus and throughout America and the world really is food waste. All that energy is hidden within there. How, think about how, the, how much energy it takes to grow the food, to process the food, to move the food, to keep it refrigerated or in a condition to be able to be edible. There's a lot of energy hidden in that. So by capturing that, we're, our solution is education, teaching people how to manage their waste as a resource, operations, things like our vermicomposting facility, the anaerobic digester, and other ways of mitigating food waste. And more importantly for us, worms. So we had to come up with a plan. So we had to move the, the, uh, the operations from the Hort Farm to the back lot of the surplus store. We we're a brownfield site, which provided all sorts of challenges, which I'll talk about in a little while. But I like the idea that we used to store coal ash in this spot, which was a wasted product or a waste product that was toxic to the, the earth. And now we're producing vermicompost, something that re-enriches the earth. And I really like that cycle that is closed. We've kind of closed that loop in a way there. Uh, and this was possible because of a grant through IPF. Um, they graciously were able to give us seed money in order to start this operation um, and move everything from the Hort Farm to the surplus store. Overall, worms need shelter, water, and food. Not all that much different than you or I. Operationally, we need to combine food waste with leaves. You know, we have to have a certain amount of carbons with nitrogens, the greens and the browns. That's the pre-composting mixture of the food that we actually serve to the worms. We then compost that material to make it microbially active. Again, the worms don't actually eat that food waste. They eat the stuff growing on the food. So you want it microbially active. And lastly, you got to be able to harvest the finished product. Right now, we use wheelbarrows at the Hort Farm and a pitchfork, which are very trusty and sustainable. I like the power and magic of hydraulics and the scale that MSU has requires. We need that ad additional power, and we've designed this facility to be operated with a bobcat and a wheelbarrow, in addition to just a wheelbarrow. So, And most importantly, we try to have the worms do the work themselves. Like John mentioned, we have the worms on the edge of the wedge. We let them sort themselves out. We don't screen them, that sort of stuff. So. Operationally, the most important thing we needed was water. You know, it's the base of all life. Getting the hydrant to the spot we needed so that we could have water year round, even in the cold, took 18% of our budget, which was a substantial amount of it. But it's vital for worm health. Every time we mix that food to get waste with, you know, um, the leaves and the other materials like John Mix and his wheelbarrow, we found that we were adding almost 10 gallons of water per wheelbarrow. And it's vital to maintain wedge moisture. And San Fortino from IPF was an integral in making that happen. Asphalt was uh, the sub, the base that we decided to have for the um, hoop house. We wanted to be able to drive material equipment on there. We wanted to be able to scoop up very cleanly. And so not having a hard packed earth and going to something that was either asphalt or concrete. And concrete, unfortunately, was out of the budget. So we did have limitations uh, in order to make a successful um, operation here. Um, Asphalt was cost effective. I love that it's a recycled product. Almost 80% of our asphalt is recycled. Um, and we were able to partner with Matt Fahrenbach at IPF to make that happen. Building the hoops was a whole lot of work. Uh, our hoop that we have, which is 96 feet long, uh, was a Zimmerman hoop house and was a substantial portion of our budget. We actually, again, uh, took the three R's in order and actually reused the hoop house. We, John had two hoop houses at the horticulture farm and we were able to move one using labor uh, uh, with the surplus store staff. Um, there's two hoops, one houses the worms, the other one houses the food for the worms, and we also have a leaf bunker. Well, something that was amazing is that we have a 10-foot clearance. It feels like you could play basketball inside of our hoop house because there, it's so tall inside, and that's really important when you lift up the bobcat on how, how high the arms go. You don't want to put a hole in the hoop. It's just plastic. So uh, this was essentially built on our spare time on Tuesdays and Thursdays when we had downtime in the material recovery facility at the recycling center. Uh, and Dr. Bierbaum helped uh, teach us how to build a hoop. And um, we learned so much on doing that. And it's been great to be able to start composting uh, in our backyard now. So I wanted to talk food waste at MSU. Uh, we produce a lot of food waste on campus because we have a lot of people on campus in normal times. Right now we're a, bit, a little bit lower than normal, but there's some good with that. And I'll talk about in that in the next slide here. But over the last two years, uh, between the digester and the worms, we diverted almost two and a half million pounds of food waste. That's an awful lot. Um, 
this year we're closer to about 50,000 pounds in the last uh, six months or so here, which is pretty impressive. To put that in the uh, figures, we typically offload about 45 gallon buckets um, of compost in uh, the uh, hoop house when we are collecting normally. Uh, it's got, actually gone up a little bit now because we've actually been diver diverting most of campus's food waste now um, through worm power instead of um, sending it to other processors, uh, which has been a great story here. So currently, you know, we're getting about 25 of those 65 gallon containers, those black and yellow food waste containers that are on campus. In October alone, we did almost 13, we did 13,000 pounds. Those food waste carts are so heavy. Julia will talk all about how uh, processing and moving those are just a whole lot of fun, but they're essentially the raw materials that we feed the worms. And we're currently able to, uh, again, divert almost all of campus's food waste currently through worms through that pre-composting process. We're able to divert and uh, compost meats, dairies, and other things like that that normally we would not be able to do in a compost because of this method. So I have to give props to Carla and her team for making all that happen. Essentially, John talked about this a lot. I've got some pictures of the wedges here on the left. Uh, the middle picture is how we split the wedge. You see there's kind of a gap in between. That's where we have the worms on one side and we kind of split that wedge so that we could harvest the vermicompost and hit the worms to sort themselves and be at the edge of the wedge because you know worms like to live life on the edge. Speaking of living life on the edge, uh, the wedge temperatures we have on there for, from September through to November here. And you can see how those kind of uh, uh, declined over time as the temperature outside declined. You can see spikes which are caused by adding hot food waste or hot composted food waste, which is their food. So what can you do now? You know, ultimately everyone wants to be able to do something after one of these um, webinars. And I'd like to give you a couple action items that you could try to do at your own place. So the first thing that everyone can do is take a more conscious decision and on what you're producing at your house and what sort of food waste you're producing mostly. Um, you know, think about how much you buy. Buying in bulk always isn't a great thing. If you buy bulk avocados, unless you make a lot of guac, you're going to be throwing composting an awful lot of that. So you can think about how much you need to buy before time or when you're at restaurants or at dining on campus. Think about the meals or the portion control that you have. You can start diverting your food waste now by trying to compost. Uh, consider building your own composting uh, system or vermicomposting system. We have, we'll link you to a, a, a kitty litter bucket style that I designed on our website. There's a Rubbermaid bin style and really the sky's the limit on what you want to do for worms. So, and ultimately, if you want to support our efforts, buy some vermicompost, grow amazing veggies, and most importantly, brag to your friends about how awesome your veggies look. So with that, I want to pass it off here to Julia to uh, talk about the other amazing things that we do at Food Waste, but really closing the food loop takes so many hands. It takes so many people working together. And it really is a, a kind of a land grant mission of MSU is solving tomorrow's problems with today's resources. And the food loop being closed is certainly a great way of doing that. Thank you, everyone. All right, let me pull up my slides. Okay, so hello. Uh, to reintroduce myself, my name's Julia. I'm the Vermicompost intern. Uh, I'm a student here at MSU. I'm studying advertising and then environmental studies and sustainability. Uh, to give you a brief background on myself, I've been working at the Recycling Center as a sort line worker for the past two or so years. And prior to six months ago, I had no experience in composting. Um, with this internship, I've been able to learn a lot about the red worms and composting as a method of disposing and diverting our food waste. Just like Sean mentioned about the problem of food waste, in the US accounts for 30 to 40% of our food supply just being wasted. Um, and each week I get a pretty clear image of how much food we waste on campus. This little center photo is me rinsing out a food waste bin, which I do about 40 or so every week of just rinsing out food waste bins and those smells of sustainability I'm well, <laughs> well, accounted, well accounted with and I know pretty much every smell now. Um, it's definitely been eye-opening to see the turnaround that food waste can have. I was not very familiar with composting and vermicomposting in specific before I came back six months ago. Um, I think it's a huge resource and I really think that rethinking how you dispose of your food that you are just gonna throw away is, can go towards bettering your garden. Uh, being able to see it done on a larger scale has definitely been incredibly cool for me to see because I think normally you start on a lower scale, smaller scale being in your household, but I get to see all the foods coming from the calves, which I get to see meats and all of these meals being 
eaten and disposed and pre-composted and then turned into materials for the worms, which I think is incredibly cool because it doesn't always seem possible. Uh, I'm super happy to have been able to do this internship and learn everything I did before this project. I had never used a drill, much less been able to say I built a hoop house, which in these images behind are the hoop house that we spent the past six months building. And I think we just are doing the final touches now and I'm super excited to be able to check that off the bucket list. <laughs> Um, and then my last slide is just kind of taking us through our food waste that we already have. These photos are taken today. So this first photo is the pre-composting pile. This is the second week. So as you can tell, you can see as all the food has broken down. And the last one is the one that you are ready to give to the worms. And I think it's super beneficial to see the alternative to landfilling food is this is the stuff that you're throwing away. And then you can see it put to this and then have the worms eat it and then you can put, turn it into a vermicompost fertilizer. And that's pretty much all I have for my slides. Let me stop sharing. Excellent. Thank you so much everyone for sharing all your insight. Um, really does take a team like Sean said. It's great to hear all of your different perspectives. Um, we're going to open it up for questions uh, today uh for for the team and um if you are on zoom feel free to hit that q a button at the bottom of your screen to enter your question and then if you are on facebook go ahead and put that in the comments and we'll get through those um and uh, it looks like perhaps um dr bierenbaum might be having a technical difficulty maybe he's getting kicked off so if there are any questions that go to him we'll we'll hold off because I don't see him up here quite now. All right. Um, so, uh, Chris, do we have anything that's popped in yet that uh, is for Sean or for Julia? Yes, we've got a couple of questions that have come in so far. Uh, Sean, you might be able to handle this one. Um, if you're pre-composting, how long does it pre-compost for? Uh, for pre-compost, at least three weeks um, on what we're adding. It takes a little bit longer with the meats and dairy that we currently have in there. Again, you, you don't want to finish the compost. You want it to still be uh, kind of hot when you uh, finish it, because when it's hot, that's when it's the most microbially active, and that means more food for the worms. So you want that population to spike kind of like a bell curve would. So you want to hit it at the peak of the bell curve, which is about three weeks into the composting process. Okay. What, uh, another one for you, Sean, uh, what is the lowest temperature that the worms can take? Like, can, can you put them in the garage if it gets too cold? Definitely. Uh, my worm bin lives in the garage all year. Um, as you saw from Dr. Bierenbaum, they, they can live in ice and as long as they're conditioned to it. Uh, when I lived in a townhouse, my wife actually let me keep it in our kitchen. Uh, if you do things right, it smells like a pile of leaves. That's one of the great things about a home worm bin is that there's little odor. And that's why a lot of people are able to do it in small places like residence halls, apartments, or you know, townhouses or somewhere where you don't have a backyard where you could do a traditional hot compost pile. So yeah, they certainly could do a garage, even in Michigan. I mean, yeah, don't leave the garage door open for them. You'll notice that they'll just slow down a little bit. They find uh, worms are most active between 60 degrees and 80 degrees is the ideal temperature for inside of the pile. So obviously the pile temperature may, different than what the, be, may differ from what the air temperature is. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of people on Facebook and on Zoom asking, do we sell worms? And if not, how can we get some? Uh, we are working on the way of being able to sell a starter pack for worms or even a way of selling a, a DIY worm bin, which I believe, Chris, you linked uh, that kitty litter design that I have. And that's a great starter bin. It's a little on the small side, but for one person in a residence hall, it's a great way of, of doing that. Um, I would Google Red Wigglers or Acidia Fidenta is the Latin name. Uh, we, again, hope to start selling it potentially in the spring here from the surplus store. Um, uh, certainly, there are a lot of op options online to purchase them. You do want to be aware of the weather. Uh, the worms will survive in cold temperatures when they're in their bin. But if you are shipping worms, you do have to be a little bit on the careful side of when you do that. I will say we, I bought my worms online my very first time, and my mailman never looked at me the same again when, it, when he saw a big box that said, you know, caution, live worms. Now, uh, can you, uh, Dustin asks, can you compost citrus? It is certainly something that in a small area, 
Uh, well, yes, composting citrus is completely possible in a normal hot compost. For the worms, citrus is a little more acidic and it's not as uh, nice on the skin as what you know other um, materials might be for the worms. So I wouldn't say it's their most uh, preferable food. However, you know, if, so like if you're feeding a bin at home, you might want to lay off the citrus. Uh, one of my great friends, Caden, who uh, helped me work on worms and was one of the original worm wizards at Surplus Store, he and I differed where I never fed worm, my worms citrus, where he just fed them just about everything and they did just fine. I can tell you, we feed them lots of oranges, lots of lemons, and eventually it breaks down and the worms eat it. They just might go for other things first besides the citrus. So um, if you're adding too much, you might have pH issues like John mentioned, um, but like as everything, uh, moderation, everything in moderation, nothing to excess. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to keep you on just uh, <clears throat> asking more questions here, Sean. Uh, what are, Dave asks, uh, what are some of the uses for vermicompost? Is it just for growing vegetable plants? It is for any uh, plant really is what you want to um, use vermicompost for. You can apply it directly like John mentioned. You can also make teas, which is another way of making a micro population spike within it. And that's kind of like vermicomposting 201, which will be another lecture hopefully coming soon to a webinar near you. Um, but that's mostly what it's used for is growing plants. It really doesn't help animals or anything else like that. It is mostly for gardening, but it's a fertilizer, not necessarily a soil amendment, if that makes sense. Uh, do you have any tips for getting beefier worms? Beefier worms, yeah, it's, it's all about the nutrients that you feed them. Uh, sometimes we get like some lethargic looking worms that are just aren't wiggly and they're not even doing the worm at all. They're just not wiggly. Um, a lot of it's due to either temperature, moisture, or what I found mostly is the, the food that you're feeding them. You wanna make sure that they're getting something that's uh, a diverse product. Just like you and I, variety is the spice of life. They do like to have a little bit of mixture things. So if you're feeding them the same thing day after day, you may find a little bit uh, more lethargic worms. Also lethargic worms might just be an indication that your bin does not have an optimum habitat. So much of worm farming is just making a habitat for the worms. Really the worms do all the work except for a little bit of work done by the bobcat with hydraulics. The worms do the heavy lifting really. Um, so uh, we try to let them do the work wherever possible. Okay. Now uh, Marge asks that she has an electric food composter that heats and grinds all foods in a compost, Does that will, will that remove the microbial stuff inside? If it reaches temperature, it's uh, amazing how fast microbes break down. Like when you're cooking a meat or stuff at home, you want it to reach 160 uh, to kill the, everything. Compost doesn't really hit that, but there is a, uh, a process called the process to further reduce pathogens, which is a PRFP, where you need to keep it, I believe, above 130 degrees for more than 50, or more than three days in a 15-day cycle. Um, I, don't quote me on all those figures. I would have to, you know, research just a little bit, but you do need to keep it at a certain temperature for a certain amount of time. Uh, a desktop one that does that, I would check the manufacturer, what they say they heat it to. I, my in the indication would be if they're selling it uh, and it's an approved product that you would be just fine on doing that. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know where that would, how that would work for worm food. You could certainly try it. Uh, even if it's, you know, not all the way composted, uh, the worms will still find food within it. They just not might be all wiggly. Right. And you mentioned meat there, which transitions well into Caden's question. He asked, did you say you're putting meat and dairy in the mix? How is that going? Well, it is certainly a new research thing. And again, I think that's one of the, been a, the great success story is that you know, with a campus population that's normally around 14 or 15,000 people having 50 to 80,000 meals a day, we now have about 2,500 people on campus. And so uh, we made the ambitious goal on trying to divert all of campus's food waste uh, during this uh, COVID time where we don't have a full campus population and we wanted to try to accept everything. And yes, that includes meats and dairies. Uh, really the magic where that happens is the pre-composting method that John mentioned. Uh, as long as we're able to compost it enough, we can feed that to the worms. I can personally tell you, and Julia will speak even better than I, two weeks ago, I dumped a food waste container full of roasts. Um, it was, you know, football sized roast. They tumbled out like watermelons. It was crazy. Uh, the worms eventually did move into it. We had to break it up a little bit more, but it, as long as you try to, you know, break up that product, keep turning that compost pile a little bit more than uh, normal, we're having just no problems whatsoever feeding the worms meat. We've been doing that since the summer. Okay. Got a two party here from Brian. Yes. Uh, can you use the compost on indoor or outdoor plants? And also, can you burn the plants by using too much compost? 
Vermicompost is, uh, John would be the perfect uh, person to answer the nitrogen content of vermicompost. Um, from what I understand is it's not really something that will burn your, your, your plants because it's not a very high NPK. It's very low values, like a chemical fertilizer might be a 20, 20, 20 for NPK. Vermicompost is like 0 0.5, 1, 0 0.5 or something really much smaller than that. And so vermicompost typically will not burn your plants. And yes, you can use them for indoor or outdoor growing. Uh, as John showed you, he has several pots like big bay leaf plants that he's kept alive for over 10 years using just vermicompost as the supplemental nutrients in there. So um, yes, it's great for uh, indoor and outdoor products. It'll really make your plants go banging. Uh, I'm going to keep this uh, rapid, fire go rapid fire going at you here. Uh, Louise asks, if I buy a bucket of vermicompost, how long will it last? It all depends on how much uh, work, how much garden space you have. Um, I know I use several buckets a year. Um, you're basically using a cup or a quarter cup to sprinkle around the base of your plant. So however many plants you have, that bucket may last you a very long time. Um, it'll certainly stay, you know, want to check the moisture content if you're keeping it for multiple years or anything like that. But that vermicompost, it depends on how much you use it for gardening. If you're using a cup or so sprinkle around each plant, that bucket will last you quite a long time. If you've got a long, a big, huge garden, uh, you're going to want to look at different options to buy, maybe in bulk, and that'd be something I'd be happy to tell you about because we happily sell vermicompost by the yard as well. Okay. Uh, Carla asks, how do you work around compostable products if they sneak into the food waste? Compostable products are one of the enigmas I have out there. I think they're a great option to fossil fuels. However, they can only be broken down in certain uh, uh, instances. Uh, the Oregon, uh, the state of Oregon had a great pamphlet recently that talked about how they did not want to take uh, compostables anymore because of the potential contamination and how they break down. There just hasn't been enough research on it. One of the great things I think of is we take so much energy taking corn and turning it into plastic. We just want to snap our fingers and turn it back into you know plants and compost again. And it takes a lot of energy to do that. And so the only way you can really break those down is with a uh, traditional or a commercial composting facility where you're keeping it very high temperatures for a long time. So I can tell you if I find compostable stuff and it composts fully, it will still stay in there and still look like a plastic fork. We will pick it out and try to recycle it or send it to one of our uh, composting partners within the state who do have the capacity to break that item down. Okay. Uh, another one for you here from Dan Bowman. He asks, do you send the pre-consumer waste to the digester and the post-consumer waste to compost, or is it a mix? So the digester takes the pre, uh, the post-consumer food from Brody uh, Hall, That's uh, which is 10,000 pounds or plus a week. It is an awful lot of material. They mostly take the post-consumer stuff, uh, but it's got to be pulped first and, and grinded up, and Brody is the best place that we have on campus to provide that food source for the digester. The pre-consumer stuff, like the onion peels and carrot tops and stuff like that, we accept from every dining hall, and when Sparties are open, we take all their coffee grounds and food waste too, and we're even looking at options of starting up a bucket club, whereas if you have a way, don't have a way of getting rid of your compost, that we could issue you a bucket, and you could take that bucket and fill it with compost and uh, bring it to us to feed to the worms and do a little bucket burger. So um, there are many options on, on doing that, but yes, it seems that uh, the digester mostly takes the post-consumer. Okay. Uh, can you use temperature to determine the best timing for moving worms? For, uh, we just recently moved the worms um, from, you know, we moved about 100,000 two weeks ago or so in early November when it was a little bit warmer. Yes, you want to certainly be careful how you're moving the worms. If you're exposing them to air, they like that 60 to 80 degree range, and that's uh, an important uh, temperature range to kind of keep them in as transporting them. You don't want to stress them out. They're a biological system. So it does have tolerances and usually they'll be able to recover, but you don't want to shock the system too much. Okay. And Dr. Birnbaum is here and he can certainly talk to that if uh, he uh, wants to interject. Now, you did mention how, uh, worms there. Let me take a, let you take a, catch a breath there for a second. How many worms do we have at our 96 foot facility? What do you say? Oh man. So at the Hort Farm, I would guess hundreds of thousands. Uh, typically, the running estimate is 2,000 pounds, 2,000 worms per pound. We moved uh, almost 40 pounds of worms just recently, uh, and there are a whole lot of worms already moved in there. I'll leave that to Dr. Beerbaum for an estimate. It, the last time we tried, it was, it is 2020. We did send them census forms, but none of them returned it. Um, so I'll leave this to Dr. Beerbaum. Okay. You were close there, Sean. It's about 1,000 um, mature worms per pound is the number that's used. I, I think with little worms, it could be as much as 2,000, but 
Um, part of it, we think of uh, how many square feet of surface area that you have, and this would be true for a small bin or a big bed. And uh, on our wedges, we would want to have at least a pound of worms per square foot of surface area. And I think at times when we've had everything working right, we've been even higher than that. But uh, we've had out there as many as uh, 500 square feet of surface area. And that would put us at uh, a minimum of 500 pounds, which would put us at a minimum of half a million worms is what I've said that uh, we've had for quite a few years once we got the population up and running. And uh, in the beginning, I thought we were doing a good job with worm composting, but it took us really about three years before I realized just how much it took to get um, a really healthy uh, population and the, the numbers that make the difference. So uh, we've been there for the last five years or so but as Sean said, I guesstimated we moved about uh, 50 pounds uh, in the last few weeks, and then we'll be, you know, continuing to move them as we get the uh, first wedge developed and then the second one. Okay. Uh, now, John, while you were gone, uh, we've been a lot of questions. Uh, we have gotten several compliments on Facebook and in the Zoom comments about your alliteration. So that was very much appreciated there. Um, and also, uh, Megan asks, are any of your lectures about worm biology on, up on YouTube or uh, able to be watched somewhere? I would say no. There is, uh, I think there's one handout on my uh, departmental website. If you, uh, it's not Hort dot uh, anymore, it's through the College of Ag and Natural Resources. But if you just search uh, for with my name, John Bierenbaum or John A. Bierenbaum, uh, I think the website will come up and uh, there's about a 10 page handout there on worm biology. Um, but that's something as I have more time, uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, that potential of uh, developing uh, an online course related to the worm composting and, and more of that information. Uh, to a quick book that's available is uh, Rhonda Sherman. Um, and, I think about a year ago came out with the worm farmers handbook I think it's called uh, looking over towards my bookshelf to see uh, if it's there but uh, that is a book where she's gone and visited there it is the worm farmers handbook um, and it's not for home scale composting it's for um, small farm composting and she's had the opportunity to go all around the world and visit sites and uh, learn about worm composting and uh, that's what she shares in the book and she's the one that organizes the conference that I mentioned that I uh, went to uh, in 2012, 13 and 14 where there would be as many as uh, 100 to 120 people that would come from again all over the U.S. and some from internationally to learn about the worm composting particularly uh, you know on a larger scale. So I'm glad you brought that book up. Um, is that would that be a good resource for uh, Devin asks, asks that his house has 14 people in it and they're looking to compost. Would that be a good way to learn how to do that for a house of their size? Um, if they're looking just to start composting, I would say no. That this, you know, there's that would be helpful for giving some ideas about worm composting, but. Uh, in a house like that, I, I'm not as quick to recommend worm composting for people at home as others are. I, I know people that do it successfully, but I know a lot of people that have started and not been able to continue uh, for the long term. It's, it's something that like taking care of having bees or having other, you know, livestock that it's, it's a lot of uh, work and you have to make sure things are done correctly. They can go for weeks and months without any problems, but if you're not paying attention, something could happen, and uh, you know you just you need to be prepared uh, yep. for general composting. Uh, I don't. There's so, I have so many. I have about 20 different composting books. Um, the Rodale Institute uh, book on composting is what we use in the composting class, and it was published in the early 90s. But it's still you know a very good book. Uh, I think it's uh, Rodale, hand, 
composting handbook or something like that. And uh, uh, it would be often in the bookstores for uh, spring semester because it's used in the online composting course that I used to teach that I developed and that is uh, now being taught by someone else, but uh, is available within the horticulture department. Okay. Um, now, Sean, you might be able to answer this one a little bit better. Uh, we have several questions who people are asked about, um, are there any, uh, is there any plan to expand uh, food waste and composting in the dorms? Uh, I think, I think uh, on a more personal uh, individual level, not on the cafeteria side. Yeah, I think, you know, having an individual be responsible for their own food waste is really the way that, you know, that true change will happen, you know, so I would, we will definitely want that to happen. We have a lot of issues with collections on doing individualized uh, compost pickups. Um, we are looking to expand that with the bucket club where a Spartan could enroll into a bucket club where they would get the five gallon bucket a week or based on how many people live in your residence hall or, or apartment or whatever to be able to collect that material. That's the method we're looking to try to do. That's probably in the spring or summer next year is the earliest I think we'll be able to get that program up and running. Um, but collecting it, like I would love it if you could take a bite of an apple, finish that apple core and be able to walk down the hall at Wells Hall and toss that into the, re the recycling station that has a compost bin next to it. There is a lot of challenges with, from custodian and other places in order to get that collected before it gathers fruit flies or other unwanted pests and maintaining the health code uh, and safety issues too. So it's a complicated answer. Contamination is a big issue too. Um, we got to make sure people are not putting plastic or other things in there. Biological systems like the worms have a high threshold for or a higher threat tolerance for contamination. We just have to physically pick it up. The worms will eat around it like every sticker that's left on an avocado or banana peel. The worms leave every sticker behind. The same with the fork, pre the forks that we talked about a little bit ago too. So, um, you know, other methods have a little bit lower tolerance for contamination and uh, that has challenges too. Okay. Uh, Sean, now Sean, can individuals bring food waste to, the, be, to be composted at our, at our facility right now? We are looking for some pilot members for a bucket club. Um, we can't take too many. That's something that we're looking to try to get off the ground here, uh, hopefully uh, relatively soon. So if you're really, really interested, you should contact us uh, if you're interested in enrolling. Otherwise, look for the spring or summer to see a way for people to be able to um, bring their compost to the recycling center. I have a great dream of one day having a food waste bin across the street. Uh, I'm sure Julia is cringing uh, about having a food waste bin at the drop-off center where people could dump their buckets. There are a lot of challenges just to make that happen, but it's certainly a vision that is possible given the right resources and uh, labor. Okay. Uh, Sean, what are the benefits of coffee grounds and composting? Oh man, coffee grounds. Well, the worms get addicted just like you or I, and they need their coffee in the morning to get running, and that really makes them wiggly. So um, Dr. Beermom will be able to speak to this a little bit more, uh, but we have typically did feed them coffee grounds from Sparties in the past. We're now feeding them a more diverse diet, and uh, John knows a little bit about the nitrogen content on the coffee grounds, and I will happily pass it off to him. All right. I can say that uh, last Friday, a little under a week ago, uh, Brooke Comer, who has been working on her PhD, uh, that was in part funded by this project. And she worked a lot on the worms, but she worked on a lot of other composting aspects. And one of the things we were able to do is uh, in the lab, we fed worms just five, diff five things individually. So just for six weeks, like we took the pineapple or the melon, um, which the worms did fine on. Uh, we did uh, carrots because there were a lot of carrots that came from the dining halls. We did onions and there's a lot of books that will tell you that worms don't do well with onions and you should avoid putting onion skins and onions in. But our worms over six weeks did you know, the, the same on onions as they did on the other things. But the coffee grounds uh, was one of the other treatments and uh, basically coffee is ground up seeds. So uh, seeds have what plants need to grow in them and uh, not while some comes out when you brew the coffee most of the minerals and particularly the nitrogen that's there uh, so when we look at uh, regular compost might have uh, one percent nitrogen in the finished product which will help plants grow if you go to dairy manure compost, you know, where they're eating more grains and there's more nitrogen in the uh, uh, manure that uh, that might have 2% or 2.5%. 2 
But with the coffee, when we were adding a lot of coffee grounds into the worm composting system, we've gotten numbers as high as three and three and a half percent nitrogen. And I think that that's you know, just one of the keys to the qualities of the uh, grow green Burma compost is, is the, the coffee. And, you know, I will, you know, just to confirm that John, we, we, you know, was being somewhat sarcastic. We don't know, maybe the coffee, maybe the worms really do respond to caffeine, but we don't know that. Um, but we do know that they uh, grow well and they do well in the coffee uh, you can find things online that will tell you coffee is bad for worms, but it's not, you know, the things that I've looked at that said that on YouTube, it wasn't really good information and they, you know, our data would disagree with that. And we've seen the worms do quite well and the compost is a good quality again, and uh, with a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium in it. Okay. Uh, I've got a question here for Julia. Um, so someone has asked, what's the thing that has surprised you most about being the compost intern? I think the thing that surprised me the most about being the compost intern is seeing how many things are actually compostable. I didn't know that meat could either disappear in three weeks or much less looking at, we have a pile at the Hort farm that's chicken remains and there's only bones left. And I think that's the thing that surprised me the most is I never thought that was possible. Very cool. Now, um, John, you mentioned earlier that there are some delays in stabilizing the populate the worm population. What caused that? I would say, particularly at the beginning part of the project, that um, again the worm population was doing okay, but it was us learning the frequency of feeding. Uh, I think water management was a really big one that uh, it's challenging in a small bin, you know, it's if you're putting in a lot of wet food waste like vegetables that it can get uh, too wet. And that's one of the things I like about the pre-composting is, is that we're able to adjust the moisture before we uh, add the compost to the worms. And, uh, but on the, during the summer, we uh, are watering at least every three or four days uh, or three times a week, I would say three or four times a week and uh, at a minimum of Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, and we know that the worms would do better if we could water them more frequently. So, you know, water is really big in there. Uh, I think the balancing the, the food and uh, having it fresh enough and having enough carbon, like the, the leaf in there, having that uh, balance between bedding and uh, food is important. And I think to some extent, the worms tend to adapt or acclimate to a system. Like all our worms came from, or isolated from uh, our horse manure piles at, uh, at home. And you know, we, the first year we pulled out about 50 pounds and got the project started. We brought a few more, but uh, the next year, but mostly we grew that 50 pounds into 500 pounds and uh, it was getting them uh, adapted we just did a little project with the start of the new wedge. I actually brought in a little bit of horse manure and put it on the ends of the wedges to see, you know, if um, bringing that in because the horse manure would have some unique biology into it. And we're also, I was explaining to folks on the project it also has some sand in it and the worms, you know, need, they have a gizzard or like a chicken does. And so there needs to be some grit or some soil and you don't want a lot of soil in your worm compost, um, but it having some in there will help, you know, with the worm digestion. So all those pieces of learning how to feed, how to water, how to take care of them, how to keep the temperature right uh, is also is a big part of it too. Okay. And I'm going to bounce back to Julia again. Uh, someone has, has asked, how can they get your job? How can they get an internship working with the worms, doing what you do as a student? Um, how I would say just keep informed or keep watching the MSU recycling page. Uh, I would highly suggest getting involved with a vermicompost or just composting a general job. I don't know how you can get my job. Um, just probably stay tuned and opportunities that present themselves. Okay. 
And uh, I think, uh, Sean, this one might be uh, aimed for you. Do you have any estimates on how much methane has been reduced as a result of our food waste diversion program? So I've been looking at this question for a little while, and uh, it's, it is a tough one to answer. The, the short answer is no, we haven't measured uh, how much we personally have reduced. We do look at greenhouse gas emissions based off trips to landfill or how much it takes for us to physically move material from one spot to another. So that was an easy thing for us to measure. As far as the actual offset, we do have some equations that we've been working on to try to figure out how many pounds of food waste equals X amount of greenhouse gas emissions, and we haven't made it there yet. What I can say is that food waste does produce methane gas as it, uh, as it breaks down. And methane gas is 28 times more powerful than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas and something that contributes to climate change on the planet. So this is a, uh, a, an important thing to try to keep out of the landfill. And many uh, states, and I believe Michigan is one of the states where they have a yard waste ban from the landfill um, because they don't want that material breaking down and producing excess methane gas that they want to try to capture what they currently can. Uh, from it. So uh, I will say it's it's qu probably quite a bit because the food waste is that major source of it. Um, as far as the actual number, unfortunately, I don't have that. Okay. Uh, Sean, can you speak at all to the economic impact of vermicomposting? Absolutely. Um, so a lot of it is cost avoidance where we're not taking trips to the landfill or not, you know, wasting all this energy that's hidden within this food waste that we uh, have worked so hard to collect. But uh, one, it provides jobs, you know, recycling uh, in general provides seven jobs, whereas a or landfill typically provides one job in studies that I've read that recycling creates more jobs, it's more hands to make that material to be diverted from the landfill as opposed to going into the black abyss, which is that landfill. Again, landfill is a good thing, just too much going in there. So uh, Avoiding that is the major um, you know, cost savings there. So where you would have been paying to get rid of that material in the landfill, the compost is an option where you, know, you wouldn't be incurring that tipping fee that was out there. Additionally, uh, our whole business model is what our mission is, which is managing waste as a resource. You know, landfilling it isn't really make, treating that waste as a resource, whereas composting it takes that waste product lets the worms do the work and then turns it into an amazing organic fertilizer that can then be sold. Uh, and we have been selling buckets um, and starting to do bulk sales. In fact, we had a couple bulk sales last week of a few yards uh, of, of vermicompost soil blend. So um, that is starting up. I'll say we're a little behind on the marketing and that is something that ha is happening um, now that we're working on business plans and trying to make it so that we can get this great worm stuff into your hands sooner. Okay, it looks like we have one question left. Uh, this one's back to Julia, and it is from Keith. And he asks, do you have any idea how you use what you've learned in the next stage of your life after you graduate? How has working with the worms prepared you for life outside of this internship? I definitely think just my experience at the Recycling Center for the past two years or so has definitely kind of shaped what my career goal would be. I think I really like learning about vermicompost and learning about plants and how that's applicable to real life and then how that can kind of divert waste. I really enjoyed that aspect. So I think that it's kind of changed what I want to do for my life. So it's kind of like this opportunity has changed what I want to do more than how I'm going to apply it. I don't know if that answers your question. I'd say it did. And that is all the questions that we have gotten. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Those 36 questions that is by far the most you've gotten, the most successful uh, Q&A session that we've had so far. And thank you to our three warm, uh, extraordinary people for taking that rapid fire uh, questions. Now, Katie, back to you. Wrap this up. Awesome. Uh, yeah, echo what uh, what Chris just said. You know, great job, everybody. It was really cool to um, hear how much knowledge is coming out of um, out of our team. So thank you so much for that, and to everyone who's attended and you know with such interest in this topic. It's really cool to see that. So um, great night, good um, good town hall. Urge you to consider joining us for our next town hall in December. Um, we're going to be um, having uh, a guest from the MSU Broad Art Lab who will be talking about um, upcycling ideas for the holidays. So join us for our upcycled holiday cheer town hall um, on December 10th at 7 p.m. Um, and we want to um, just show our appreciation for, you know, like I said, our your engagement with us. So we've got a coupon code for 15% off of the surplus store um, that is being dropped in the chat. And um, uh, for those of you who are um, 
uh, have registered on Zoom, we'll send you a follow-up email for just the um, details on that. Um, it's valid through the end of December. Um, and, you know, just one more shout out to the uh, Verma Compost operation and just how excited we are that this is going to be something that can help us really highlight all the different aspects of the zero waste hierarchy from rethink, reduce, reuse, recycle, and rot. Um, it's an important thing for us to have this operation on campus as a learning experience. And so we look forward to incorporating this into um, our new virtual tour uh, in the future. So. Um, just keep um, following us on social media and um, as always send in your questions to um, to our surplus or recycling page and we'll uh, relay those to our, our team to get that answered for you. So uh, and we've uh, got one more uh, question that came in. Someone asked could, uh, with the follow-up email that you send, could you include a list of some of the books that were mentioned here tonight? Oh uh, yes, I will try to go back in there and edit it. It's an auto email. Um, but I can drop my email in the chat to everyone. And so if the person who asked that question wants that, um, can email me directly. Hey, hey, I responded to their question in the chat and gave them the Worm Farmer's Handbook by um, Rhonda Sherman and then Worms Eat My Garbage by Mary Applegate, I believe is the author, are the two books I referenced earlier. Okay, great. So I will look for that in the chat. And then if I can edit the, uh, it's an auto email that gets sent out. So I'll do my best to, to get that in there for everyone because I'm sure that others would be interested too. All right, on that note, thank you everybody. Have a lovely evening. All right. Good night. Sean, I'm sure you got a joke for us. I'm just waiting for the punchline. I was, just saying, thanks, I was trying to unmute myself. Thanks for being Wiggly with us, everyone. Really, your hands make a difference. Every action that you make does, every step you take to divert your items to the landfill, to ma manage your own waste as a resource makes a difference. Uh, it's really the true way of being Spartan Green and really connecting to that land grant mission of MSU. And really it's good for you know the entire planet. So it's amazing what we can do when we work together as a, as a species. Yes, for sure. We need that today. Everyone have a lovely night. Catch you next time.